Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the, um, the uh, association, the AFA, for the organization of such a very, very interesting conference as usual, and for yourselves for also attending, and I hope we have uh, an interesting lineup of presentation this morning. Uh, but I am sure the uh, organizations of the AFA has made a great effort to select some very uh, distinguished speakers. Um, I think there is a slight change of plan. Um, I was going to start uh, the first session, but I think we're sorting out the, uh, the presentation, so I think we will change. Um, and we will have um, Mr. Alberto Persona, uh, who will be uh, speaking about um, the phosphate market. He's been uh, nine years um, with, um, uh, with Feticon, of course. So he's, be, he's a principal analyst with Feticon, uh, nine years, so I'm sure he knows uh, a, a bit about phosphate. So he'll be uh, talking to us um, about understanding the Chinese and the change in the Chinese market. We all know how important is uh, China. Uh, but I'll talk a little bit more about these details once we introduce each other. Uh, he's given a presentation instead of his colleague, which was coming from China, and unfortunately, due to the uh, ongoing epidemic of the coronavirus, he was not able to, uh, to attend. We will, um, we will then um, have uh, Mrs. Darina Pichiriskaya, I hope I pronounced it right. Um, Mrs. Darina is new to the fertilizer industry. She works with um, Kem Courier, a Ukrainian-based uh, publication, uh, and um, she'll be uh, talking to us about the uh, urea and phosphate global market, particularly the CIS uh, ongoing changes, and with a focus on um, the forecast for the urea market. We will then uh, also have uh, engineer Glenn Kurokawa from CRU in the UK. Uh, he's also, uh, I believe we have an, uh, a selection of phosphate experts, so he will be talking to us about the global phosphate market. Um, when my presentation will be ready, hopefully uh, the second one, uh, I will uh, be talking to you uh, about the African market, the change in dynamics. My name is Munir Halim, and I'm managing director of Africom. It's a publication consulting firm that uh, initially focuses on Africa, but particularly on fertilizers around the globe. So without further ado, uh, I would like to invite to the stage Mr. Alberto Persona, and uh, we look forward to hear some interesting insights on the phosphate market. Please join me to the stage. Assalamualaikum. My name is Alberto Persona, and uh, thank you, Munir, for the presentation. Thank you to the uh, AFA organizers for inviting me. As was mentioned, uh, my colleague Isaac Zhao was origin originally meant to give this paper. He is unfortunately uh, stuck in China with uh, limited uh, chances to travel outside of the country because of coronavirus. He's fine. His family's fine, so everything's good. He sends his regards, and I hope I will give him justice in presenting this topic. Uh, He's uh, a very experienced analyst uh, on the Chinese market. Uh, if there is any questions, uh, I will be more than happy to put you in touch with him if I cannot answer it directly. I work at Ferticon IHS Market. Uh, it's a relatively new transition. Ferticon has been acquired by IHS Market uh, in uh, July 2019. For those familiar with the Ferticon brand, nothing has really changed other than the fact that we are now part of a different group. And that group allows us to enhance our uh, analysis on a variety of uh, angles, so covering oil and gas, covering uh, freight and transportation, covering chemical and industrial uses. So all in all, it's very exciting times. And the presentation will occasionally take some things here and there from other parts of IHS markets uh, uh, analysis power. Just to give a quick overview of the contents of today's presentation, we will discuss uh, the Chinese agricultural and policy context, and that is actually the most important thing, because what we want to convey is an understanding of what is driving ch changes in the Chinese market, why things are happening, and everything else, the demand outlook, the supply outlook, the trade outlook, uh, 
all of this should become a little bit more understandable if we really understand the reasons behind it. Of course, in today's time, we cannot avoid the topic of coronavirus. It's not a market mover, but it can have market impacts, and it's in everyone's mind. So we will discuss a little bit what the current understanding of this epidemic is. Now, starting with the Chinese agricultural and policy outlook, this chart shows China's uh, um, harvested land in the green uh, grassy bit, uh, like area, versus overall production for grains. Now, the first thing that strikes is this jump in land area that is actually due to a change in the way the Chinese government accounted for land. But overall, the main message that I'd like to convey is that land dedicated to growing cereals and, and uh, agricultural products has remained very flat. Yields have been growing very dramatically from the early 2000s. They have started to flatline somewhat in 2000 and from 2015 onwards. But China clearly has uh, experienced a very big change in terms of its potential to produce crops. And we can see that this applied to almost every major crop type, from rice, of course, of very cultural importance in the Chinese diet, to maize, an essential component of uh, uh, the livestock industry in the country, wheat, sugar, other oil-bearing crops. Everything has been a growth story. So this growth in production came across crop varieties, with one exception. And that exception has been soya. Soya output, which is shown in the green negative boxes, are actually, has actually decreased a little bit over this period. And what has changed is China simply accepted that soya is not the crop of choice for Chinese soy, for the Chinese climate, and they increased their import requirement. This has, of course, benefited other countries from an export point of view, for example, Brazil, or before trade frictions, the United States, to just mention the two largest trade partners. Alongside growth in agricultural uh, production came a series of challenges. Of course, when production becomes gro uh, grows so fast, one needs at some point to regulate and to set and change the rules of engagement of the agricultural market. So we had a lot of reforms, some dedicated to agriculture itself, for example, reform on social welfare and rural land, so part of the schemes for land allocation to uh, local cooperatives or local communities versus the private sector, for example, adjustments to the support prices and the subsidy systems in the country that have helped uh, the farmers adapt to changing market conditions more flexibly, or improving agricultural technology and efficiency, teaching farmers uh, how, to how to make the best even of a small plot of land. There were, have also been more and more policies dedicated to the fertilizer sector itself. The most famous one that made some global headlines was the 2015 announcement of zero, a zero growth target for, for fertilizers and pesticide use by 2020, and we will go a little bit more in detail on that later. We also had the removal of domestic subsidy for fertilizer prices, and with the removal of subsidies, there was no need anymore for export restrictions. This was a very important policy because it really marked the transition of the Chinese fertilizer market into a more market-oriented um, sort of uh, approach. And lastly, the lift environmental standards. Environmental standards have become a very major concern of the Xi Jinping government. Uh, this has affected the nitrogen industry to a very strong degree, the phosphate industry to some degree, and there are continuous updates even on a sub-national level on what exactly this means. So the topic of gypsum is one of the hot topics at the moment. And of course, air pollution, water pollution, soil pollution continue to be important topics. Therefore, overall, the industry has changed in line with these changes in Chinese agricultural and policy environment. We started from the 2000s, when China was the largest import market, even for nitrogen products. Slowly but steadily, China developed its own capability, and importantly, its own technologies, its own patents, to make the best of China's um, potential of, and natural resources, particularly phosphate. Um, in 2006, uh, 2006 to 2010, we have the strong inversion of some of the trade balances from net importer to net exporter. Between 2011 and 15, we had a massive surge in export availability across most products, excluding potash. Uh, and that caused our, the need for a change. The growth was unsustainable from a market point of view. And from 2016, and even to this day and in the future, there will be still a transition, an adaptation. It's been a little bit of an overshoot of the Chinese industry, which now needs to find its balance. With this context in mind, 
we now need to understand the drivers of change. This is an overall picture, but now let's look a little bit more in detail with what has happened recently. First of all, the policy that we mentioned, that zero growth policy in uh, at least N and P205 years, was actually already not binding a constraint as of the time of announcement. Phosphate demand had already peaked the year before, and focusing just on urea, we can see that urea demand as well had clearly peaked before, between 2011 and 2013. So setting a zero growth target was actually not a huge ask of the Chinese domestic market, because that had already happened thanks to this wave of transformation of the agricultural side. The case for potash is a little bit different. Potash still has growth potential in the Chinese market. It's still not optimally applied. However, low crop prices have not encouraged the Chinese farmer to adopt this relatively expensive nutrient in an agronomically sensible, uh, sensible way. But the main thing, what is the factor outside of agriculture and outside of the fertilizer market dynamics that really impacts uh, the Chinese development and that's population, that's demographics. China hosts 1.4 billion people, and that already is something very important. There's a need for food, for calories. There is a need to feed about a sixth of the world population. And this population is actually transitioning into a more and more urbanized setting. We can see on the chart on the right, the rate of urbanization of the Chinese population is very, very strong. This is important because, on the one hand, it reduces labor availability on the farm, on the other hand, you need those farms to produce relatively more and the labor productivity to increase. Wages, as a consequence, have adjusted. They are not still close to market values for uh, uh, labor rates in urban settings, but they have increased. That the production side of the Chinese agriculture has become less labor intensive and therefore focused on optimal application and optimal application of time. In fertilizer, we know, takes time to apply. But also, this aging, the, the population is moving to urban centers and partly due to the one-child policy that was in place until three years ago, we have this pagoda-shaped demographic pyramid. There are challenges ahead because fewer people are required to sustain with economic growth and with GDP production, with value-added production, a larger share of people and in about 20 or maybe 10 or 20 years' time, we may start seeing some very strong uh, pressures on the Chinese uh, um, social security system in terms of uh, pensions, for example. All, uh, and uh, the population in China might have peaked as well. Some people assume that Chinese population ha could decrease in the long term, at least for a hiatus of time, as we so show on some uh, pr uh, projections by other consulting agencies uh, uh, in the bottom right. Overall, the amount of labor which is possible to uh, obtain in the farms has decreased and is going to decrease even further. And even more so, another strong need of adaptation and a consequence of urbanization is the need for water. Water in China is a surprisingly scarce commodity, is a, a scarce resource, and particularly in the northeast of the country where most of the agricultural production is, you actually have less water. You have a particularly dry springs in the northeast of China where most of the, um, of the grains are grown, for example. There are some uh, regions like Xinjiang in the northwest or Inner Mongolia in the north where water used by the agricultural sector is already limited by policies. And in many cases, there are strong encouragements to use water, to divert water away from uh, the agricultural sector in order to enable the population. Uh, to have sufficient reserves for a residential use or for even industrial use. In the southern part of China, there is more water abundance, but there is also more pollution, so the water quality also became a concern, and fertilizer can have an impact on water quality. So all of this means that we need to be very careful on looking at water as a constraint, and that constraint forced some changes. The rise of fertigation mechanisms, for example, so irrigation and fertilization at the same time, and investment in water efficiency, a change in crops away from water-intensive wheat and into different varieties, these are all consequences. These are adaptations of the Chinese industry to the constraints that it is facing, water and population being possibly the major ones. This was the setup. So this is, we now know why the Chinese industry is changing. The supply outlook would therefore kind of be um, a reaction to this, and it's an adaptation, it's a secondary in a consequence of this. 
When looking at urea, the decrease in capacity in urea, of course, matches the peak in demand that we have discussed earlier. As we can see, capacity had been growing up until 2015, so capacity grew for a longer period compared to domestic demand from the agricultural sector. And uh, clearly, a reduction in capacity was to be expected and did happen. As we can see, the reduction in capacity from 2016 onwards, partly fueled by these environmental um, policies that have been in place since, it has not really affected utilization rates. So that capacity was not necessarily needed, and that's why we didn't have a strong price response in the urea market. And one in interesting thing is if we focus on the area chart, which is capacity, in 2020 we are actually forecasting a slight increase in capacity, and that's because those companies that remained in the industry, they didn't just sit idle and continue producing urea, they invested in quality um, and improvements in technology. They invested in understanding better and increasing the energy efficiency of their ammonia reactors. And actually, there is still a lot of uh, uh, replacement capacity, where some old plants are replaced with newer, more efficient plants. So the urea market in China is not dead. The urea market in China still has a long way to go before it really reaches a uh, balanced figure. And when we look at the supply outlook, since the supply in China is really a function of demand, because the purpose of uh, um, Chinese fertilizer capacity is to ensure availability to the domestic market, we can actually forecast a growth story for China, although this chart shows the relative split between industrial uses and agricultural uses. Industrial uses are what will be driving uh, the demand growth uh, in uh, China, and therefore the supply side of the, um, of the market will need to adapt to this. They will need to focus more on technical grade urea or low biuretal urea, for example. When looking at phosphates, I may look a little bit more comfortable now because this is my area of expertise. Um, the, uh, China is uh, a huge market for phosphates. They have, uh, at the moment, a lot of uh, extraction capacity, a lot of phosphoric acid capacity. One of the problems is that there are more producers of phosphates in China than in all the rest of the world combined. And this created frictions because it was very difficult for the industry as a whole to adapt to a global market scenario. The coordination problem across so many agents becomes a very big issue. And what could change this year is that uh, the Chinese industry tried to find a balance, tried to find a, a unique voice, and that was called the 6 plus 2 conference. They were the six largest producers and the two largest distributors. But in China, 6 plus 2 does not equal 2 plus 6. That's the new name of the producers' conference, and now it's the two largest producers plus the six largest producers again. So more capacity is represented by a single voice, by a single uh, um, entity. It's not a formal entity, but it still has some power, and it holds much more mining capacity compared to other um, producers in the country. We show on the chart on the right how the 2 plus 6 producer group is actually larger than any other player in the phosphate industry, even larger than OCP when considered as a whole. This could change the industry in China and could make it a little bit more reactive in terms of reducing production when not, in a, not that much output is needed by global markets. And alongside, uh, similar to what was happening in the urea market, Chinese producers are also looking within their own value chains to find ways of uh, adapting uh, to, uh, to a different market scenario, of particularly to lower prices for fertilizers as uh, proven in 2019. Chinese producers happen all through the cost curve uh, for the phosphate industry. Many, particularly in the middling ones, so someone in, um, from the middle to the third quartile of the cost curve, are moving away from fertilizers while remaining on phosphates. And a very common way they're doing this is moving away from diammonium phosphate, so the top, to purified phosphoric acid. Wong Fu has been spearheading this with the strong capacity developments on purified acid. Uh, Kailin, which is now part of GPC, the, after the merger with uh, Wang Fu, they also will follow suit. Yun Tianghua has done that, uh, Liu Guo Chemicals have done that, Lo Mon Chemicals have done that. So many companies are trying to diversify their downstream offering away from fertilizers, and that's another adaptation to this changing demand dynamic that is happening within the Chinese market. Of course, there are some producers that don't have access to technology, some producers that don't have access to sufficiently good quality phosphate rock or raw materials in general, and they could be a little bit more exposed to market forces. Similarly, in the case of potash, again, the transition away from focusing on just the fertilizer industry and agriculture is very perceivable. 
uh, China is in a very strong net deficit of potash, and uh, it's quite interesting to see that although capacity for MOP has increased, operating rates have decreased, so total output in the domestic market hasn't risen. Partly that's because uh, some of the producers in China, they are based on uh, Salt Lake brines, and they are focusing on non-potash minerals that are present in these brines, for example, on lithium. Uh, this uh, is uh, uh, quite interesting because usually you would expect a country with a net deficit to try and minimize that trade deficit as much as possible. Uh, in 2019, there was also a removal of uh, export taxes for products containing uh, uh, K2O as a nutrient. Therefore, we have seen a rebound in uh, um, SOP exports and also we have seen an increase, a strong increase in MPK exports, which is causing some frictions between potash suppliers and Chinese producers. And since we mentioned trade balances in the couple of, uh, past couple of slides, it's quite interesting to remember that as much as uh, uh, China has a huge surplus on most commoditized fertilizers, we see AS, DAP, urea, all of these are very strong surpluses, they come with value chain deficits, particularly on sulfur and on MOP. And if we compare overall trade patterns from China, we can see on the left we show a, sort of a color-coded map of where much of the export surplus from China goes. Unsurprisingly, a lot of it is in the Asia-Pacific region, region, with the only exception being Brazil, which has been a big driver of global growth anyway. So China ha almost had to enter the Brazilian market to balance its own flows. There's also very strong deficits on the right particularly uh, on the potash side with Canada, Russia, and Belarus having the strongest deficit, but also on the sulfur side. So the Middle East and Canada as well, double down, uh, and Russia, they would all contribute to the Chinese value. And looking at overall fertilizer trade balances in value, so in dollar terms, yes, China is a huge exporter, but it's not really a huge net exporter. Uh, about uh, um, uh, two-sevenths of uh, Chinese surplus is based on imported raw materials. And clearly this is trade values only. There's a lot more value added that is generated for the domestic industry. But perhaps China is not as strong an ex a net exporter in value terms uh, or in value added terms as one may think uh, just by looking at the volume statistics for urea, phosphate, and ammonium sulfate. And overall, China is, has become a much more reactive market to market changes. China, uh, for example, on the urea front, we can see clearly how in 2014 and 15, urea exports from China peaked to above 12 million tons of product. However, they also adjusted very sharply, and the decrease that we have seen in exports has been much stronger than the decrease we have seen in domestic demand or in production, as we discussed before. But they have also rebounded as strong, not nearly as strongly, but they've doubled year on year in 2019, thanks in part to coal prices. So coal prices have been decreasing, and this has made more Chinese urea competitive. This is a sign that the urea market has actually become much more reactive to fundamentals, to uh, margins, and to normal economic theories uh, to, uh, when looking at a microeconomic level. And um, I also thought my colleague from uh, the potash team also really wanted me to uh, present this slide. Um, the Chinese contract prices for MOP have been one of the big drivers of the MOP market. They kind of set an expectation for the market. They commit a lot of, uh, um, of volumes from key suppliers. And uh, what's interesting here is to note that the imports have been relatively flat on a three years uh, adjust, kind of, um, sorry, on a four quarter moving average. And overall, there's continuous delays to uh, Chinese contracts. We have seen this in 2009, which was perhaps an exceptional year, but we've seen it in 2015, we've seen it in 2016. And we, for those interested in the potash market, we don't think that China has a strong interest in settling contracts during the, 2000, the first half of 2020, at least, and we expect a little bit more spot purchases. There is a value, a strategic value to contracts, but we expect spot to be a dominant part of the market in the first half. And again, this is of interest because, again, spot purchases rather than strategic contracts are more market driven. So we have the adoption of market logic as an adaptation to a changing demand and supply environment. Now, as promised, uh, we just want to give a quick overview of what is happening with the coronavirus. Coronavirus is this strand of virus which has been particularly infective to humans, partly because it was unexpectedly infective to humans and it started with animals. 
uh, there's uh, a lot of text that uh, everyone will receive these slides and uh, you can read through the details of this. What's important to notice is that the coronavirus originated in the city of Wuhan, which is the capital of the province of Hubei. The province of Hubei is host to uh, a bit of urea capacity, but to a lot of DAP and MAP capacity. So for the phosphate industry, that is actually very, very important. What is happening is that uh, any deliveries of product uh, is kind of stuck. Uh, especially truck-based deliveries require the drivers uh, of the, these trucks to be put in quarantine. They require uh, a lot of control on the safety on animal residues. So the logistical system in China has been bottlenecked quite considerably. There is at the moment no proven concern, no proof, no proof that the virus can spread from commodity to humans, so from things to living uh, organisms. Uh, some importers are a little bit concerned about this and they may avoid uh, uh, purchasing products for China for a short while until this is confirmed. But all in all, what this all is causing is that port deliveries and ex particularly exports of Chinese product uh, are not happening for the, a very simple reason. People in the port offices are not in the office. They have been asked to stay away. They cannot commit to a, uh, to a loading day. To, they cannot commit to a docking day for the vessels. So there are frictions that are slowing down the pace of the, the Chinese uh, um, fertilizer export side. On the other hand, yesterday stocks, uh, port stocks were reported as increasing, so there is also no sign of a shortage of material even in the domestic Chinese market. And I think that's also important to remember because as much as coronavirus makes the headlines in major newspapers, and yes, there is a very strong risk to the global fertilizer industry and to the global macroeconomic industry as well, uh, like microeconomic scenario as well, there is no sign that this is a disaster at the moment. Uh, it's too early to prove it, and unfortunately, it's not a market driver, and it's not in the industry's control. So we have all to wait and see, and avoid uh, taking too strong an action. I'm nearly there, Bonnie, don't worry. Um, this is just a snapshot of the infection rate in China. Unfortunately, this slide is already old. This was prepared two days ago. This is updated daily by the Chinese government. This is just showing just how focused on the Hubei and surrounding areas the infection still is. Uh, it's spreading with the individual cases elsewhere, but it still remains a very localized source. And lastly, a small mention that this could, of course, have a broader macroeconomic impact uh, on the Chinese economy. We currently project uh, a little bit more than 2% uh, in terms of GDP growth as an impact uh, on the Chinese economy because of this freeze in uh, trade, in international trade during the first quarter or at least the first two months of 2020. Uh, apologies for rushing through the last slides, but I've been given a, an eye from Munir. Thank you very much, and if you have any questions, uh, uh, I can try and answer them now or uh, take them after. Thank you, Roberto. It's, um, um, it's a very, very interesting presentation because you did cover one of the uh, most interesting regions. Uh, with all products and with the complication of uh, the latest uh, corona developments. So congratulations. Um, we will take a couple of questions from the floor. Uh, if uh, you want to use this opportunity to ask Roberto any question. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Roberto, for the nice presentation. It was marvelous, really. I would like to ask about the subsidy for the... You, you said that the subsidy was stopped uh, since a couple of years, something like this, and also the export taxes. What kind of uh, subsidy was performed and how they proceed for uh, suddenly stop the subsidy and uh, uh, the export taxes or gradually or what kind of uh, such thing? Thank you. So it's, um, thank you for the question. Uh, okay. it's, um, it's actually a complicated thing. And of course, uh, the, what happened was the removal of subsidy came alongside a removal, a removal of the VAT. So, and at the same time, there were still in place some support prices for crops. So although the price of fertilizer increased, the overall balance sheet of the farmer did not change, uh, at, like it changed a bit, but not proportionally. And it was softened by other things. Um, it took a few years uh, to continuously decrease these support prices and put really agriculture on a market-based trend. For example, um, from the time when the fertilizer-specific subsidy was removed, we had an increase in the support price for, uh, for corn, 
and that resulted in a very strong uh, increase in production of corn, which in turn resulted in very high stocks of corn in China because not, of all of, uh, not all of it will, uh, was consumed. So China is very good at making very strong policy decisions, maybe more so than many other countries in the world. But on the other hand, there's so many policies and they are balanced out throughout them. So the announcement is very strong, but the impact is not as strong. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Any more questions? Um, I have one for you. Um, you did touch on, on an interesting subject that is close to my heart, is the NPKs. Um, it, China went from almost a net importer to a sort of a balanced importer-exporter now. I mean, it's importing about a million ton and exporting also to the region. But that was helped by the regulations and removing the uh, export tax. Do you see any change in the future uh, and potential of increase or decrease of exports of NPKs from China? Thank you, Munir. That's a very interesting question because there's a lot of variables involved. For example, personally, I think uh, um, potash producers may not be happy with uh, uh, increasing NPK exports because China receives potash at a discounted contract price at the moment right. and then exports NPKs particularly to Southeast Asia or as you would know to Mozambique quite a lot. But uh, um, in Southeast Asia, that's a premium market for primary potash. Mm -hmm. So the potash suppliers like Campotex, or Belarus Kali, Rural Kali, they may not like seeing their, bis their potash business eroded by material that they send at a discount to China. I also think NPK exports are a very good way for the smaller players in the Chinese industry to uh, balance their cash flow. They produce MAP domestically for the domestic season in spring and autumn. They can export NPKs particularly to Southeast Asia during the uh, inverse import season. All in all, however, there's uh, better ways of supplying the Southeast Asian market or even the East African market compared to export availability from China. So I think because China needs to maintain production throughout the year, some will remain, but I also expect a little bit of a decrease in two or three years' time when the NPK market evolves uh, alongside in a global setting. Makes perfect sense. Thank you. Very quick one, please, uh, in terms of... Thank you for the presentation, Roberto. My name is Mohammed from GPIC. Uh, I have just one question. You have shown one uh, interesting slide regarding the comparison between the coal price and the urea price. Could you highlight the, uh, what are the drivers for the change in coal price? Ooh. I could try and answer, but I have uh, uh, many more colleagues that would hate me if I d took a call question. So I, um, if you don't mind, let's meet after, and I will try and get your contacts and put you in touch with those that know much more than me <laughs> about coal. Sorry about that. Is it more about the regulations in China and the, you know, the number of mines, all these things? I would be lying if I uh, said that I know. So I would uh, really need to... Uh, check with my colleagues, uh, they would know better. I'm sure there is a supply-demand balance angle and that policy plays a role, but I don't know any of the details to give you a full answer. Okay. Sorry. Thank you, Roberto. That was a very good answer. It's, uh, with some, so th uh, let's thank Roberto again for a very interesting presentation. <laughs>